think Gene Day. Ah, yes. Got it. First, I want to thank Gene Dam. He's on our, our Friends and Foundation board for linking us to today's speaker. Unfortunately, Gene is working, even though he's, I, I thought he retired, but he's still working and he's unable to be here today, but he sends his best wishes, especially to Anita. And our speaker is Anita Thayer. She's an attorney interested in civil rights among many other issues. Uh, last year, just because before the attack of the coronavirus became apparent to almost all of us, she reviewed a book about the efforts of the banks and the real estate industry to deny blacks nice housing. Today, she's reviewing a book that has a somewhat reverse, more cheerful tone, one that shows what we all, black or white or of other colors, can have to gain from stopping racial discrimination in housing and all the other places where it's found. The title of the book is The Sum of Us, with a bit of wordplay, since sum is spelled S-U-M, and what you get, not S-O-M-E, what you have left after throwing a bit away. Its expl explanatory subtitle is what racism costs everyone and how we can prosper together. Its author is Heather McGee, and I expect Anita will tell us more about the author. Over to you, Anita. Great. Thanks a lot, Roger. And thanks for everybody for signing on. And thanks for the library for this opportunity to discuss an important book that has made quite an impression um, since it was published earlier this year. As Roger said, the book we're discussing is called The Some of Us by Heather McGee. And the subtitle is What Racism Costs Everyone and How We Can Prosper Together. And I think the best introduction to the book is how Heather herself starts off the book. And I'm gonna read her first paragraph of the book. Heather, right, Heather McGee writes, why can't we have nice things? Perhaps there's been a time when you you pondered exactly this question. And by nice things, you weren't thinking about Hoover craft or laundry that washes itself. You were thinking about more basic aspects of a high functioning society, like adequately, adequately funded schools or reliable infrastructure, wages that keep workers out of poverty or a public health system able to handle pandemics. The we who can't seem to have nice things is Americans, all Americans. This includes the white Americans who are the largest group of the uninsured and the impoverished, as well as Americans of color who are disproportionately so. We is all of us who have watched generations of American leadership struggle to solve big problems and reliably improve the quality of life for most people. We know what we need, why can't we have it? And the book that Heather McGee wrote is the answer to this question, why can't we have nice things? Heather McGee uses her experience as an expert in economic policy advocate advocacy in this journey into the foundations of racism and the impact racism has as our poly, on our poly choices, po policy choices as a government and our individual expectations from government. People of color and particularly black Americans are typically cast as the victims of racism. And yes, this, is, this group is totally the victim of our long history as a country of slavery and continuing, continuing racial oppression. But according to our author today, this fact obscures another important truth, i.e. that all Americans, including white Americans, pay a price for racism. McGee talks about the zero sum paradigm the idea that one group must progress at the expense of others. And McGee shows exactly what is at stake when so many whites believe that bettering the success of racial minorities comes at their own expense. That is what's good for them is bad for us. The majority of this book is specific examples of how this zero sum paradigm has in adversely impacted both Americans of color as well as Americans who identify as white although the impact on Americans of color has of course been more severe. Each chapter in this book discusses a specific problem, uh, how racism as illustrated by the zero sum paradigm has prevented a logical resolution of the problem. 
Each chapter is grounded in both academic documentation and on the ground personal research. I note that this book is well documented and includes 308 footnotes. The final section of the book discusses what McGee calls the solidarity dividend, how progress can be made and all can benefit when folks works to get work together to solve a problem across the racial divide. Heather McGee is an expert on economic and social policy. She was born and raised in Chicago. She has a BA from Yale and a law degree from UC Berkeley. For most of her working life, she has been associated with Demos. Demos is a liberal think tank focused on solving economic in inequities and increasing civic participation by developing a more inclusive democracy. McGee worked on various projects and issues at Demos, including the increasing student debt, workers' rights, how to get money out of politics, unfair taxes, predatory lending, and low voter turnout. The approach of Demos was to focus on facts, figures, analysis, et cetera, to show electeds and decision makers the societal benefit of various economic reforms. Demos an analyzed these issues in terms of class. One of McGee's motivations to explore the themes in this book was a gut reaction that racism might be playing a bigger obstacle than Demos was acknowledging in their approach to policy advocacy. This personal motivation was magnified when McGee questioned why so many white voters voted for Donald Trump in 2016 when his policies were contrary to the economic interest of many of his working class supporters. This book was published earlier this year, 2021, and immediately became number three on the New York Times bestseller nonfiction list. This is McGee's first book. Although McGee had appeared on network and cable news shows before the publication of her book, she has been a near daily presence in the national media with the publication of this book and significant interest in her approach to racism by the American media. I found this book especially thoughtful and thought provoking. Although I had read other anti-racist books and essays, I found that some of us particularly useful in my thinking about race in this country and what we can do to build a better country and a world for everyone. Interestingly, it is a very warm and compassionate book in spite of some of its depressing topics. If you wanna read a book that is optimistic about our, our country's future, this is the book for you. The first chapter of the book opens with the story of the drain pool. As part of the New, new Deal, there was a tremendous commitment in all levels of government to creating public goods, but there was an asterisk to this policy. These were generally benefits made available to whites only, especially in the South. Cities in the 1940s and 50s, the 1930s and 40s built among other things, huge grand resort style municipal swimming pools. Then in the 1940s and 50s, black families began to win court cases. We pay taxes too. Our families should be able to swim in these pools. But instead of integrate, into, integrating the pools, many cities drain the pools. McGee tells of Montgomery, Alabama, where they drained the pool, filled it with dirt, closed the whole parks and recreation department down, closed the zoo, sold the animals, and and they had no parks program for 10 years. Now in the city of Montgomery, no one could go for a summer swim, white or black. This pay behavior was replicated in hundreds of places, mainly in the South. And this phenomena happened to our entire economy where once white voters in the 1950s supported a job guarantee and a minimum income for all, this kind of support disappeared once the civil rights movement made it clear that this kind of economic benefits would go to black people as well. The, sum, the zero sum narrative that McGee describes is that there is a massive dividing line and black and white people are on two opposing teams and that progress and benefits for black people has to come at the expense of white people. This is what we hear from the right wing in this country. You are a maker or a taker, a taxpayer or a freeloader, us first is 
versus them, et cetera. Another example of the zero sum politics is um, McGee's discussion of the failure of certain states to opt into Medicaid expansion. When Obamacare was passed in 2010, it expanded and standardized Medi Medicaid benefits across the state. But in 2012, the Supreme Court invoked states' rights to permit states to opt out of Medicaid expansion. Because it was now optional, as of last year, 12 states had opted out of Medicaid expansion. Without Medicaid expansion, people of, of color struggle more as they are most likely not to have health insurance through their employment. But the largest share of the 4.4 million people in these states that would have benefited from Medicaid expansion are white people. Medicaid expansion, let me point out, is a good deal for the states. The federal government pays 100% of the cost the first few years and then 90%. The states that accepted Medicaid expansion saw hundreds of thousands of people going from uninsured to insured. Hundreds and thousands, no, hundreds of rural health clinics have been able to fund new programs and expand services. However, Texas, which has the largest number of uninsured residents, has seen a rash of closures of rural hospitals because these hospitals are going bankrupt as they are forced to treat a number of uninsured patients. Now vast swaths of rural Texas are without emergency or hospital medical services at all. Mickey also discusses the increase of student loan debt. In the 1960s, when the college student population was overwhelmingly white, one could go to a heavily government subsidized public college or university and graduate free or nearly free of student debt. Now students are graduating from public universities and colleges with record levels of student debt. This disproportionately impacts black and brown families because of limited generational wealth. Monthly student but also means that a large number of all college graduates have monthly student loan payments that are equivalent to a mortgage payment or making a second rent payment. So each of these topics, Miki goes into in a lot of great detail and I'm just really summarizing here. Another chapter called Ignoring the Canary discusses the subprime mortgage loan crisis. Starting in the 1990s, the mortgage industry focused on, on, focused on marketing mortgage refinancing loans to residents of black and brown neighborhoods. These loans were called subprime because they were initially designed to be sold to individuals with less than prime credit scores. However, most of the, most of the recipients could have qualified for regular mortgages. During the period 2004, 2008, homeowners of color were three times as likely as whites, whites with similar credit scores to be sold higher rate subprime mortgage loans. Initially, subprime loans were sold nearly exclusively to homeowners of color. This was a sector least respected by the financial wor world, least of interest to lawmakers and with the least access to legal resources. However, by the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009, subprime mortgages were everywhere. Before this was all over, this country had 4,000, by, by 2017, this country had 400,000 fewer homemakers, fewer homeowners than in 2006, although the population had grown by 8 million households. Altogether, 5.6 million households lost their homes as a result of the Great Recession. Although homeowners of color were represented out of proportion, the majority of households who lost their home were white. It turns out that the early problems with subprime loans were disregarded by bank regulators who were brought into the narrative that these subprime loans were given to irresponsible homeowners who were in over their heads and did not know how to manage money. This was the narrative that, bank, that banks and elected officials promoted then when foreclosure became an ep epidemic and imp impacted thousands of owners, owners, it was homeowners, it was too late to avert the crisis. In 2008, New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg explained 
that, quote, it all started back when there was a lot of pressure on banks to make loans to everyone. People in these neighborhoods are poor. They're not going to pay off these mortgages, end of quote. The truth of the matter was that it was greedy lenders, not the homeowners, who were irresponsible. But it was more convenient to blame the crisis on irresponsible Black homeowners. Although the country's GDP and employment numbers rebounded before the pandemic struck in 2019, over two thirds of the family who lost their homes during the Great Recession will never own a home again. This would have all been pre 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 preventable if our elected officials and bank regulators had paid attention in the 1990s to what was happening in our neighborhoods of color. McGee wrote that money can obscure the most obvious truths once you resort to easily available racist narratives as an explanation for the initial wave of foreclosures, the banks could largely escape accountability. In the final part of the book, McGee discusses the solidarity dividend, how working together across the cover line, across the color line can benefit everyone. Unfortunately, this book is not, this part of the book is not developed as fully as would have been helpful. McGee discusses the success of the fast food workers to get a minimum hourly wage of $15. She also discusses the 10 year organizing drive in Georgia to increase voter participation in poor and working class communities, resulting in the first election, the first black Senator from Georgia since reconstruction, as well as the first Jewish US Senator from Georgia. Heather McGee also includes a whole chapter on racism that she entitles The Hidden Wound. Most but not all of the chapter is a discussion how, of how white people attempt to deal with racism. She discusses the colorblind approach and writes that it is a weapon against people of color, i.e. we don't need affirmative action now because we are now a colorblind society our history of racism is behind us, et cetera. The so-called colorblind approach doesn't benefit white people either, according to McGee, because when faced with the realities of racism, white people then have no skills to navigate um, cross-cultural tensions and issues. Interestingly, McGee cites a 2019 public opinion survey which found that a clear majority of black and white respondents believe being black made it more difficult to get ahead. Yet barely half of the white participants in this study believed that being white was an advantage that helped them get ahead. Mike McGee, excuse me, McGee continues her discussion by referencing Robin DiAngelo, an anti-racist educator who believes it's transformative for people to acknowledge, white people to acknowledge they have been conditioned into racism. They can then stop explaining, defending, minimizing, and then start becoming moral and strategic partners in the fight for a racial just America. McGee then references three examples. The gradual acceptance of the Somali refugees by the folks in Lewiston, Maine, who took time to learn about common values and aspirations a community group in Dallas, Texas that wrote and distributed a racial history of their city to help build a common knowledge base. Finally, McGee talked about the potential benefit of a national campaign of truth and reconciliation panels, which she calls truth, healing, and transformation. In her conclusion, McGee summarized her five lessons or five discoveries as she terms them as follows. Number one, we have reached the productive and moral limit of the zero sum model. We should always be aiming for the solidarity, solidarity dividend. Number two, the quickest way to refill the pool is to refill, refill the public goods for everyone. Number three, because we are not all standing in the same place, we must remember that one size did not fit all. Number four, we all truly need each other. Number five, we have to get on the same page before we can turn it the political and so social forces selling us denial and ignorance prevent us from learning our shared history and moving forward together. So that is my account of the book, The Sum of Us. Um, and I would urge anyone who's interested in any of the things I touched upon to read the book. 
There's also a lot of interviews available with Heather McGee online and um, throughout the internet and on various podcasts. Does anybody have any discussions or comments? Okay, if you, if you have a comment or a question, please unmute yourself and, and address your question to Anita. I always have several, but I always, I always defer to, to the others first. Oh, please start us off, Roger. Okay. Well, Anita, this is, I suppose it's a little arcane, but I'm, I'm fascinated by the fact that swimming pools and even lakes and rivers have been such a subject of a physical division. I mean, it was in, in Chicago, on the Mississippi River. If, if you were swimming on this side, it's not even like the, the, the Black people are going to contaminate the pool. I mean, I, I understand that idiotic thing. But even lakes and rivers were, was, did she address the why of this? weird segregation over water specifically? I mean, I don't think she really, I mean, she, I mean, I think there are some people who genuinely, I mean, I think there is a characterization through history that is not fact-based that people think that black means dirty. And by repeating it, I'm obviously like don't subscribe to it. But I mean, there is that notion that has followed us from history. Uh, but she doesn't, she really talks about the pool as an example of the various public goods. I mean, she also discusses the availability of mortgages after World War II to white veterans in the suburbs that often had, you know, in the cities that had, you know, boundaries for where black people and white people could get mortgages. So she doesn't discuss, she doesn't go on at great length about um, the pool is more mainly a paradigm and she does not really go, doesn't go into the rivers and the lakes and all that. Okay. Uh, this is uh, Barbara Smith. Uh, I will not be uh, visual, uh, visible today, but I do have a question. I did want to say something about the uh, swimming pools, rivers, etc. I think when you think about what people wear to swim. They don't wear very much. Uh, they, they may be wearing bikinis. If they're men, they're not wearing tops, etc. And I think that there is an undercurrent of like the sexual taboo and the sexual de demonization of Black people that may have been a part of the great taboo against having Black and white people swim together because you're not, you know, basically the people are only partially clothed. And I think that would absolutely fly in the face of uh, what segregation was all about. And then also just the fact that there was virtually no social interaction between black people in any, any context, partially clothed or fully clothed at that time. So the thing is, if you didn't go to church with black people, if you didn't invite them to your parties, uh, et cetera, why in the world would you be swimming <laughs> with them? Because we were persona non grata. I mean, I grew up during this era, so you know, I didn't read about it in a book. So my question for you, Anita, is what would motivate? I know about this book. I haven't read the book, but I know about the thesis of the book. My question is what would possibly motivate not just white people, but the white power structure to change the way that they deal with the racial uh, racial inequality and racial oppression, because I think most white people uh, are either comfortable with things as they are, or they don't either, maybe they don't acknowledge the reality of things as they are. They're invested in things as they are. And I just wanna know, and this, this would be my question if I was speaking to Heather McGee, what would possibly motivate people to change? Because I don't think logic really has much sway, particularly not these days. Well, I mean, I mean, I think the motivation, I mean, I think she would say, because she comes out of an organizing background, that we have to organize. So example, on Medicaid expansion, the people in Texas that don't have access to health insurance and are losing their hospitals because Medicaid's not available to pay for emergency medical bills um, should need to be, need to understand it's not it's a government that is standing in the way of them having healthcare. And I think we saw some 
some of the success with Stacey Abrams organizing in in Georgia, but I I don't think we're that Heather is going to McGee would look to the forces in power to make the changes. I think she's looking to us as people responsible for our fellow citizens. Um, you know, to do the hard work that makes it clear that we can all benefit if we all work together for common goals. I know that sounds a little Pollyannish. Thank you, thank you. I think there's a question here in the chat. Oh yeah, where is that? Um, yeah, isn't it? Oh yeah, Peter Slocum, do you want it? Where is Peter? Uh, you want to ask your question, Peter? Okay, I just, it's not really a question, but my understanding is that pools, public pools were the same as public schools. We'll right. Cl close them rather than integrate them. And right. Virginia yeah. is public schools after Brown v. Board of Education. And I know Nashville and many other places closed their pools rather than allow black kids to go there. I mean, yeah, I think pools is just a, sort of the example that um, that Heather McGee uses as sort of to illustrate her points. But no, she she did mention schools. She doesn't have a whole chapter on schools. But, you know, obviously there's all kinds of public benefits, schools being the most important, that were um, taken away from both white and black students because integration was ordered by the Supreme Court and other courts. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. And of course, public schools in the South started only after the Civil War when the Freedmen's Bureau organized them, right? That's the Local black communities. Right, right, right. I have a question. Um, it's sort of, it's kind of along the lines of Barbara's, but more personal. I, I don't live in Albany anymore. I live in a very rural town near a fairly progressive small city, but you know, it's this, where I live is kind of Trump country. And um, one of the things that I encounter is the sort of pull yourself up by your bootstraps mentality that that's really what it's all about. And um, you know, they hate, uh, government spending because, you know, I know how to balance my checkbook, blah, blah, blah. But I think that's a part of their, that, that kind of inherent um, objection to anything that's combating, you know, the racial divide and racial inequities. Um, this, I guess my question is sort of like, like Barbara's, but does, does McGee speak um, about how to address you know, on a personal level, how to speak to, well, for lack of a better way of saying it, you know, Trump supporters. <laughs> I mean, she doesn't address like sort of those, I mean, she has those conversations herself in the context of writing the book. And, you know, and there is, um, you know, there, she, this one person actually, she was on a public radio show or public TV show and somebody called into that show and there's been a lot written about it, some Trump supporter and the two of them had an extensive conversation on and offline and she eventually converted this man to her point of view, but that's not in the book. Um, but you know, one of the things that um, she has talked about other places and some of her, um, and some of her um, media appearances is you know, what Biden did and the Congress did with the CARES Act. So everybody right now, rich or poor, has gotten a check for their dependent children. Um, and we don't see very many Trump supporters turning those checks, those checks down. Um, so, I mean, I think part of her answer is, you know, she says in her summary, we need to make pu public benefits available to everybody. But then at the same time, we have to remember we're not all on an equal footing. And I, that butt part was not reflected in like Biden's approach. He just thought like we should start by doing this. And she has um, applauded that effort and the other kinds of initiatives that has spread government benefits, you know, throughout, you know, showing again that government can work. She thinks that's an important lesson. 
I mean, she does make the point in the book, um, people believe basically, and maybe I didn't say it that clearly, people in this country believed in government until they were told, you know, basically they have to share government and government benefits with people of color. And that somehow the media, even in the 50s, were able to capture the idea, our government is no longer our friend because they are saying integrate the pools and integrate public housing. And now all of a sudden government is, is not our friend, but our enemy and we, we don't need it anymore. I don't know if that's responsive at all, but. I think there's okay. another question here. Another question? Oh, I. Yeah, she, she, she has a whole chapter, which I didn't talk about, about um, unions and um, a, a particular struggle at a night, Nissan plant, I think it was in Tennessee, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, um, where the workers were stratified in, in terms of the workers that started in the plant first the newer workers, which were more apt to be workers of color, were hired on a contract basis, sort of like temporary workers, like through a Kelly girl type agency. And there was a union drive there and people voted against the union in part because the white workers the, that had been there the longest felt that bringing other people up to their level of pay would somehow cause them to have a dimmer future. And she has she has a whole chapter about that organizing drive and the reflections of various people after they lost the vote. Jack, did you want to say anything more about that? So if he yeah, doesn't just say anything second, more, can I ask a question? Sorry. <laughs> hold on, hold on, um, Jonathan. Uh, I just was going to say I, I did really find, um, you know, that part really uh, interesting in thinking like unions are a thing that can really um, provide a benefit for for everyone and just how or for whatever a, a mass of people um, and like thinking about how supporting unions and creating unions, um, I think, could be a way or could be approach to um, do some of this, you know, um, where it's more about the sum of us rather than, um, you know, hierarchical. And um, yeah, I think that to me, that felt like a, a point um, that she really was stressing about how when it benefited white people, they were into unions, but then suddenly um, they no longer were. And I think that that is an area that I feel like she also saying through an activist approach um, could be used to create more, um, more for all. Right, no, I agree. And she does have the sort of a shorter discussion about the fast food workers and how they were able to unite against racial and, eth and ethnic lines to demand the increase in the minimum wage. Um, but no, it definitely, that was a very interesting chapter in the book. John, you want to ask your question? Yeah, um, actually, let me start with a, um, a comment uh, that I drew from a, a book I read a while back um, called What This Cruel War Was Over. And uh, it's uh, by a historian from Harvard um, <clears throat> named Chandra Manning. And the uh, information in the book is derived from billions of letters that were written home during the Civil War. And she went about a sort of scientific sampling to get uh, some sense of what was going on and got enough detail so that she was able to um, chronicle a change in attitude um, of, during the course of the Civil War. And in her opinion, that at the end of the Civil War, the um, racism was at a kind of low ebb. And that's one of the reasons I think that, um, you know, the uh, 
Civil Rights Act uh, amendments to the Constitution were passed. Um, I mean, there are clearly a lot of people who see objected to them, but in fact, um, the good guys won. And uh, that leads to a sort of simple-minded slogan thing, which is that when racism ends up fighting against uh, freedom, um, this country is so dedicated to freedom that racism will go away. And so uh, that's a sort of preamble. And the question I wanted to ask is that, um, is there any sense in the book that uh, the tremendous problem we're facing now with climate change is going to have an impact on uh, um, uh, the racism? Well, she does have a chapter on, on climate change, which I didn't discuss um, in my remarks. And she talks about how generally we perceive the movement, um, the environmental movement as sort of a white led movement. And she talks about what um, polls have shown, like there is a lot of ambiguity when they do polling among like white people in terms of, this was of course written like a couple of year ago, this book, and she did the work a year ago and earlier, you know, ambiguity about whether or not climate justice is a priority, but there's less ambiguity when they pull people of color who often are really what she considers the true champions and fighters for climate justice, since they often are living nearer to, you know, um, pollution sites um, and a world basis, you know, people of color are often living near the ocean in Asia, you know, where what rising waters are having adverse effects. So she really believes that um, the future of the climate justice movement is, is going to be, is in part because people of color see it as our priority and she thinks that's good for all of us. I didn't answer your question directly, but she Can does have that discussion in the book. Hope that's helpful. John, that answer your question? I, I guess it did. <laughs> um, someone else? Um, I, I have another question. And it, and it's, it is, I suppose it's a little arcane. I always thought that in the, you know, when you, during the so-called civil rights period of the 50s and 60s, the people thought that this was a, a thing to help black people. But if you read a lot of King's sermons and talks, even is in is really I remember one in specifically in 1956 when he was talking it was during the Montgomery boycott and and um, bus boycott and someone he was talking to this white guy and he was explaining it, it the basis the basic bottom line is that the the white person said oh uh, well why are you doing this thing and you and the and King ultimately says well I you ought to join us too because. You're, you you've been put down as much almost as much as the black people have that it was it, it was a much more inclusive process but I don't think that's the way it was perceived I think it was like we're helping all the black people but you know but it was but his goal and particularly when you saw some of his labor stuff and some of his anti-war stuff that it wasn't just a black movement and I think that was also true of the black panthers so did he a did she talk about this at all and B, did she talk about it in terms of the, the current stuff like the Poor People's Campaign that uh, William Barber and others are, are leading? It's, as the, this, is, this is a model for, for doing this. She really didn't talk about the civil rights movement in this book um, as, I mean, I, and, and the fact that we have sort of, I think in retrospect, simplified it um, to be sort of just simply uh, a movement about integration and not a movement about sort of changing the power dynamics in this country. Um, she didn't really go into that at all. And it's interesting that she didn't, in her sort of summary at the end, when she mentions various positive things, she doesn't talk at all about uh, Reverend Barber and the Poor People's Campaign. 
I mean, that's a very short part of her book. And, you know, maybe there'll be a, 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 a postscript book where she develops some more of these um, models where people are working together across across boundaries for, for social change. So um, if anyone is interested, besides reading this book, I would encourage Ezra Klein, who has a New York Times podcast and has very interesting conversations with a number of people, has a very interesting conversation with Heather McGee. And I would encourage anybody who wants to sort of delve into these concepts more to listen to that podcast. And one of the things that Ezra raised um, in like sort of extending the the um, the p drain the pool analogy, he he asked her in this conversation about you know when the um, the Trump supporters who stormed the Capitol on January six um, were they actually saying like we don't because we can't control the government nobody should have a government. He was making that analogy to drain the pool, which is was an interesting part of their discussion. So I just think there's a lot in this analogy, and I would recommend that podcast if people want to go beyond the book and have sort of more of a discussion or virtual discussion or with Heather McGee about these topics. Any other I, thoughts? I have one. One more question about the book, which I have not read, but I was certainly familiar with it, the idea of the book and what she, the title of the book. Did she at all touch on reparations or? Yes, yes. Yeah, she does. She talked, she did have several discussions about, you know, how first redlining, well, first slavery and then redlining and then the uh, recession of 2007 and 2008 all took away generational wealth, mainly of people from color. And she talked about the value of reparations. Yes, she did discuss that. It wasn't developed, but it was touched on in her book. Yeah, what did she have a, like a, a model she touched on? Because the issue of reparations is enough people sort of agree with it in broad categories, but don't know how to do it. Right. <laughs> um, she didn't a have, a, she didn't really offer a well-developed model. No, not in this book, at least. Okay, anyone else have a, have a question or Anita, do you have anything else you wanted to say about well, almost I, anything on the topic? <laughs> well, I, th I think it's, uh, it's a, bar it's a uh, book worth, definitely worth your time. It's an optimistic book. Um, I think she is in some ways more optimistic than the facts she presents, but uh, it's really great to read a book that is uplifting in that sense. And um, and I, I think it's helpful in how we think about why we want how we want to move forward in this country from where we are now. So I would encourage everyone to read the book and and also, you know, you can she often is on MSNBC, CNN. Um, National Public Radio. So um, I would encourage people to to you know to Google her and 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 hear some of her comments. Barbara Smith writes in um, in the comments that she encourages people to read Jean Theo Harris's A More Beautiful and Terrible History: The Uses and Misuses of the Civil Rights History. And I'm. I, on Barbara's recommendation, have read that book and I would join in Barbara's recommendation. I learned so much more about the civil, I thought I knew a lot of history, but I learned a lot that I didn't know about the civil rights movement, including the, a very interesting discussion of the busing issue in Boston, where um, busing was, um, I mean, it, it's been completely misrepresented by the sort of common history. There was busing happened long before there was integration of the schools in, in Boston. People were often bused to public school and it became just sort of a fake issue um, and a cover for a lot of, a lot of racism and a lot of non-cooperation from government leaders who um, we could have expected more from. 
but I would encourage, I would join in Barbara encouraging people who are interested in the, these kinds of issues to, to look up that book. Barbara, did you want to say anything more? Yes, I'm sorry. I was trying to, I was going to put a little comment in the chat that said, thanks, Anita. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but the thing is that- Could you repeat um, the yeah, title that, of the book? a really good book for people who want to know a much more nuanced history of the civil rights uh, struggle. And uh, just like you, I mean, I was in the civil rights movements, as well as having, as well as, you know, teaching African American studies, etc. And I found that wonderful uh, facts and nuances and things that uh, are just, I'm not just, uh, not as available other places. So um, it's, it's a really good book. And for people that aren't looking at their computers and don't have access to chat, the book is Jean Theo Harris, and her last name is spelled T-H-E-O-H-A-R-I-S, and the book is A More Beautiful and Terrible History, The Uses and Misuses of Civil Rights History. Thank you, Barbara. It's also, it's also extremely well written. So, you know, it's, it's a kind of book, I, I think I've read it twice, actually. And, you know, like when you can read a book twice and be very interested in it and very engaged with it, um, it's just, uh, you know, it, it means it's very well written. It's engaging and not, uh, you know, just difficult to plow through. So when Barbara Smith re um, recommends a book to me, I always take her seriously. And I've never been, um, I never, I've never found that route to be a problem. So I encourage everyone to take this recommendation seriously as well. Thank you, Barbara. So do you have anything else, Roger? You're a fountain of questions. You're no, I'm, I'm good, but anyone, Jonathan, did you have anything else? Um, actually, I <laughs> something went wrong with the, uh, communication and so for quite a while um, I wasn't getting any sound. I dialed in a second time and after a while the music stopped and then I started hearing again. So I, I really didn't hear much of the answer to the question I asked. Um, so okay, I'm well, to look up well, you, you book can by Thea Harris yes. uh, that you mentioned. It's in the library. Available. Okay. Well, uh, you 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 can listen to the recording when it when it becomes available on the on the webs on the <laughs> website. <laughs> Let's hope that that the recording doesn't suffer from the same problem as somehow I did. But well, yeah. Well, the last anyway, time. Yeah, thank you very much, Anita. Thank you. It was thank a windy you. day outside, so this this should be good. Well, thank you, everybody. I, I, I'm, I'm sort of glad. I always get anxious for these things, so I'm, I'm sort of glad it's over. But I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> these are not mean well, people. I, mean. I, I know, and a lot of them are my friends. But that doesn't mean it's healthy to have a little bit of anxiety when you start these things that, that forces you to take them a little more seriously, right? I guess so. Yep. We, yeah, we, I'm actually we, not, not. Uh, happy that it's over because I was enjoying your comments. <laughs> well, did you have any other questions? Um, gee, <laughs> it's a huge topic and the, um, uh, it's, um, and history is, you know, I, I come at it from a point of view of a statistician. And for me, that means there's a kind of the main story, which they call a model. And then there's the reality that's behind it. And the reality always has details that don't match the model. And so, right. Um, uh, and that one of the things that makes real life interesting and it's why people should pay attention to real life instead of just going by the ideologies. Right. So, well, and well, it sounds as though the Thea Harris book you were mentioning is a kind of a, understands that. And so that's why I'm looking forward to reading it. Well, you certainly would like the Heather McGee book because it has tons of footnotes and a lot of references to academic studies as well as her on the ground in person. Yeah, research. I actually have a copy of the book. Oh, good. Um, and, and have read much of it. Um, good. Yeah. Uh, I mean, did you agree that the title actually has a little bit of wordplay in it? 
Right. Yeah. Roger pointed that out at the when he introduced it. Yeah. It's yeah, a, yeah. it's very clever. It's kind of cute. Yeah. 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 Anyway, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Thank, thank you, you all for, for having coming. Me. Thank you for joining this discussion. Good to see you, Jendi. <laughs> Jendi is the librarian of the Albany Public Library for many years. I think there was a lot of librarians on this call. Thank you, everybody, and good night. Good yeah, afternoon. Thank you, Anita thank and Roger you. and Barbara for her suggestion. Bye. Oh, that's a good choice, yes. Thank you, Barbara.